theme for this evening's high-level seminar. Tonight, we are going to discuss the implications the pandemic has and will have on our societies, both on a global and Nordic level. The setup for this event is as follows. We start with the 45 minutes where you will get to hear both the UN Secretary General and the Nordic heads of governments. The Nordic Council party groups will also have the opportunity to pose questions to the Secretary General. In the latter part of the webinar, webinar, the perspective will turn to be more Nordic and we will have a questions and answers session with the Nordic Council members and the Prime Ministers. About phases in the form of COVID-19 and how we can work together to solve it. I come from a small volcanic country in the middle of the Atlantic. Many will remember the small eruption in Eyjafjallajökull in Iceland in 2010, which caused disruption to air travel in Western, Western and Northern Europe. Let me now remind you of another eruption in Lagagigar in Southern Iceland in 1783. During an eight-month period, 14 square kilometers of lava poured out and huge poisonous clouds spread widely. Half of the livestock in Iceland died and most crops were destroyed. About a fourth of the Icelandic population perished. But the effects were not limited to Iceland. Global temperatures dropped because of sulfur dioxide being spewed into the hemisphere, causing crop failures in Europe and even further afield. Similar eruptions will happen again, maybe soon, maybe in many years, maybe in Iceland or elsewhere, where there is volcanic activity. And there will be earthquakes, tsunamis, droughts, hurricanes, plagues, and so on. Our modern societies are better equipped to handle catastrophes than the farming communities of Iceland in the 18th century. But there will be times when we need help from abroad, when we must work together. This applies to small island states in the North Atlantic, as well as great and mighty world powers. And there are global challenges which we can only solve together. This is not fake news. It is a fact. Multilateralism is international cooperation and international cooperation is not a choice, but a necessity. This year, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The Nobel Peace Prize 2020 was awarded to the UN World Food Program. My warmest congratulations. It gives me a great pleasure to give the word to Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. The floor is yours, Mr. Guterres. Please uh, turn on your microphone, Secretary General. We can't hear you. We still don't hear you. Say something, yeah. I, I can see that you speak, but we, we can't hear you. This is very unfortunate. Maybe uh, maybe we need to to improvise a little bit here because this is uh, this is the clock is running. So I suggest I hope that uh, Mette Fredriksson can Fredriksson can hear me now because I suggest that we try to handle this situation with the sound. No. 
try to say something before I ask Mette Fredriksen yes. to say something. Yes, we are here. Fredriksen can hear me. Uh, I, can't, I can't hear the Secretary General. So I suggest now that we uh, make, uh, we improvise a little bit. And I now invite the heads of government to speak. So uh, I'm very glad to invite all the head, eight Nordic heads of government. And the first one to speak that you can see in the picture now is uh, Mette Fredriksen, Prime Minister of Denmark, and this year also head of the Nordic, Nordic Council of Ministers. And you have your microphone on, so please go on. Thank you, Mary. And we will try to uh, improvise, as, as you said. I hope you are able to hear what we say in Copenhagen. It seems to be working okay. Okay. Uh, well, um, dear uh, Secretary General, um, hopefully um, the sound from the Nordic countries will get through to, to New York City. And uh, dear colleagues, um, of course, I would like to, to say a special thanks to you, um, Secretary General. I'm sure that I speak for all of us Nordic Prime Ministers when I thank you for taking a time to join our meeting. We appreciate it very much, all of us. And first of all, I would like to congratulate you and the World Food Programme on receiving uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. You are doing a very important work uh, in fighting hunger and creating better conditions for peace. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I, I, I know that all of us are now in the same position. We are all uh, fighting COVID-19. The world is still struggling with the pandemic. Um, so far, uh, we can say that the Nordic region uh, has managed uh, quite well, um, but um, we are all aware uh, that we are still in the middle of uh, this okay. crisis. Okay. Um, I think for Don't me, as, as a leader of Denmark, um, this crisis has underlined that we are more dependent on each other than ever. And therefore, the Nordics uh, and the Nordic countries um, support uh, a reformed WHO to ensure a stronger health um, uh, organization and to ensure stronger global health systems. Um, also, so we are prepared um, for the next uh, month and years. But not only do we face a global health crisis, we also face, uh, as you said, a, a climate change, uh, economic setback, uh, globally inequality, and the rights of girls and women being violated. All these many challenges have especially one thing in common. They can only be solved if we uh, take action together. And we, the Nordics, agree that we need more cooperation and more multilateralism. We support you, uh, Secretary General, uh, for your efforts to reform the UN and uh, make it more effective. In the Nordic countries, we will insist on using the setbacks of this pandemic as a sort of a wake-up call uh, to build a better, uh, a greener and a more fair world. And, of course, to deliver on the uh, Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, Secretary General, uh, let me finish by saying that uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, the UN will always find strong supporters and friends, both when it comes to politically and fin financially um, uh, questions. And we remain ready to take responsibility to, sec to secure a, a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mette Fredriksen. And we continue to improvise. And now I uh, invite Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, uh, to make. I hope you can hear me now. And I think your microphone is on. Thank you very much. Uh, excellencies, dear Nordic friends, it is an honor to speak to you today. 
the Nordic countries are strongly committed to the United Nations and the causes of multilateralism and sustainable development. And today we meet in a time of great crisis and uncertainty. The world is facing an unfolding pandemic that has exposed multiple weaknesses in our societies. Meanwhile, climate change, which affects your nations acutely, is gathering pace. Both crises point to the need for a new effective multilateralism to provide global governance on issues that concern us all. And these will be the topics for my address today. First, the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic is not simply a health crisis. Steady progress on sustainable development since the turn of the century is at risk. However, there is still some hope. The ACT Accelerator Partnership is working to deliver new tests, treatments, and vaccines. Working with partners, another 20 million new rapid tests are being made available to low- and middle-income countries. Dexamethasone has been found to be an effective therapeutic. And the COVAX facility, which has the largest portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines, is now supported by more than 180 countries and economies. To build on the success of the ACT Accelerator and its COVAX facility, the world has to immediately raise an additional 14 billion US dollars. But it is imperative that vaccines are available and affordable everywhere as a global public good, because no one is safe until we are all safe. Let me turn now to climate change. Like the COVID-19 crisis, nobody is immune. The Arctic has experienced record temperatures this year and faces the very real prospect of a future free of sea ice within our lifetime. The United Nations will continue to do all it can to ensure ambitious climate action consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. This includes limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, facilitating the transition to climate resilient economies, especially in the developing world, and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Currently, the world is way off track. It is essential that we rebuild our economies from the pandemic through effective climate action that will create millions of better jobs, promote cleaner and more efficient technologies, and bring better health worldwide. To that end, we are promoting six climate positive actions that countries and other stakeholders can take to effect a sustainable economic recovery from COVID-19. Invest in sustainable jobs and businesses, ensure no more bailouts to political industries and then subsidies to fossil fuels, especially coal, consider climate risks in all financial decisions and policy, policy making, work together in a common cause and ensure that no one is left behind. In all these, we count on the leadership of the Nordic countries. The nations you represent have historically been among the strongest advocates of ambitious climate action and of the sustainable development goals. The world needs your leadership now more than ever. We need all, all countries to submit well in advance of COP26 next year, more ambitious nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement that are consistent with the net zero goal. I encourage you to use the December 12th summit. I will co-convene with the leaders of the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and Chile to announce new commitments. And I urge leaders who are members of the European Union to ensure that the EU Council meeting in mid-December finalizes agreement on the European Commission's proposal to increase the ambition level of its NDCs so that it enshrines a commitment to be at least 55% below 1990 levels. This needs to be the minimum benchmark of ambition for all members of the Nordic Council. It is my hope that the members of the Nordic Council will serve as global model for a green, inclusive and sustainable recovery. And we also need you to maintain and enhance your financial commitments to support the developing countries. A critical part of these will be increased finance to enable the most vulnerable countries to adapt and become resilient to the inevitable impacts of climate disruption. I encourage you to use the December 12th summit to announce new and more ambitious climate finance commitments and recommit to achieving the decade-long goal of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars a year to support developing countries, both in mitigation and adaptation, and those from, and those from private and public sources. I also encourage you to work on addressing the debt crisis 
faced by the developing world, especially in this pandemic situation. Finally, we need our ministers of finance to use their voting power as governors and board members in public development banks and the IMF to push for portfolio alignment with net zero goals and to push for climate related financial disclosures to be mandatory worldwide. Forward to substantial ambitious announcements in the upcoming Finance in Common Summit. We need more of your pension funds, which have formidable potential to move the needle systematically towards net zero emissions to join the UN Convene Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. Excellencies, we have seen with COVID and climate change the need for a new effective multilateralism. Currently, our ability to act as one family of nations united in common cause is under great stress. That is why this year, the General Assembly Declaration of the 75th Anniversary of the United Nations has created space for a process of reflection on the future of multilateral cooperation. We need a networked multilateralism in which the United Nations works more closely with other international and regional organizations, including the Bretton Woods system. And we need an inclusive multilateralism through which the United Nations can draw on the great capacities of businesses, civil society, cities, academic institutions, and others. My team and I have started our work and consultations, and I will report back to the General Assembly with recommendations to advance our common agenda, strengthen global governance, and respond to current and future challenges. Excellencies, dear friends, in closing, let me commend you each for your commitment to multilateralism, your leadership on climate change, and your efforts to address in an effective way the COVID-19 emergency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General. We are so happy that we could hear you. And uh, now we continue with our program. And the next speaker will be uh, Prime Minister Bardur Nielsen from the Faroe Islands. And please unmute your microphone. Prime Minister. I can see that your microphone is still muted. Now. Here, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, 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 dear colleagues, it's nice to see you here at the screen when you not can meet in person. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Secretary General, and uh, thank you, Prime Minister Fredersen, for an unexpected start of the meeting. You did it quite well. Uh, I will uh, say something about the COVID-19 situation in the Faroe Islands that has uh, remained uh, fairly good uh, at the present time, and all things taken in uh, consideration. And uh, so far, we have uh, made the tests as uh, three times of the, our population and less than one percentage of the population have tested positive for COVID-19, and so far zero deaths uh, uh, reported. Uh, we are grateful that we have been uh, largely su successful in containing the intermittent uh, outbreaks. Our medical authorities and uh, response teams have been exemplary in their work on in uh, tracking and tracing. And uh, we appreciate the close cooperation we have had uh, with the Danish health authorities throughout uh, the pandemic. And uh, while most of the multilateral cooperation so far has been uh, mostly limited to briefings, I remain uh, confident that the Nordic spirit of cooperation will lead to better coordination and work, establish the uh, best practice and common uh, solution in the future. Uh, unlike most uh, countries, we have decided not to seek a legal mandate to regulate behavior. Our strategy has been to trust the people and let them take responsibility and to focus on information and recommendation. We therefore have to give credit to the general population Ebna, of, the I Fer unmute. of the pharaohs because they have taken the situation seriously and have followed the guidelines from the government and authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we continue. And the next speaker will be Prime Minister Kim Kielsen from Greenland. 
We have all been affected by COVID-19 throughout the planet and each nation has taken different measures to combat this disease. But the most important thing is that we all assist one another in utilizing the unique opportunities that this challenge has given us as individual nations. The many lives that this disease has taken clearly indicates that it is indeed is necessary to take action, and I wish everyone all the best in this endeavor. It is our fervent hope that this it is possible to find a cure for this disease. <laughs> And let it be possible for everyone to have equal access to medication, which we hope will be found to cure uh, COVID-19, and we'll be working with you in this regard. God protect the people on our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim Kielsen. And uh, our next speaker will be uh, Prime Minister of Finland, Sanna Marin. Secretary General, dear colleagues, COVID-19 has had an impact on every country and the global economy. Existing inequalities increased. The pandemic has been a test to multilateral cooperation, national leadership and global solidarity. We need the UN now more than ever. A strong coordinated response to the pandemic is essential. The role of the WHO is crucial in this respect. I would like to extend my gratitude to the Secretary General for your leadership during the recent months. I hope that the current crisis can act as a catalyst to UN reform. Beyond the immediate health response, Finland emphasizes green, sustainable and inclusive recovery. Green recovery can present itself as a unique opportunity to tackle the root causes of pandemics and also to boost progress towards carbon neutrality. We need to make sure that all the actions and investments we make today support the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. We need innovations to reach the SDGs. The recovery from COVID-19 requests also a digital transformation. Bringing the digital gender divide is more crucial than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanna Marin. And our next speaker is Norway's Prime Minister Erna Solberg. Secretary General and dear colleagues, um, this pandemic demonstrates the need for international collaboration. Uh, our Nordic cooperation and dialogue has been crucial throughout the crisis, as has our relationship with the European Union. And we thank the European Union for including both Norway and Iceland in its vaccine procurement, and of course Sweden for being the facilitator to make this happen. But most important, I believe that, that this is a global challenge and it requires global cooperation. It requires our multilateral systems to function. That's also why Norway have said uh, uh, yes to co-chair the global effort on access to COVID-19 test treatments and vaccines, the ACT Accelerator. And that's also why we took the initiative to have a UN COVID-19 response and recovery fund. This is a crisis that affects health, but it also affects our economy and our livelihood, and it will have long lasting effects. The world economy has been hit even hard. On a global level, the economic effects will likely be felt a long time after the pandemic. And that's why our recovery from the crisis has to be done in a multilateral cooperation. And we must build back better. We must build back greener. And as you know, as Norway always said, we also have to build back bluer, taking the oceans into account. Thank you much, very much, Anna Solberg. And our next speaker is Stefan Löfven, Prime Minister of Sweden. 
Thank you so much, uh, Secretary General, colleagues. Uh, I think it's fair to say that this pandemic has highlighted uh, the need for cooperation in the most brutal way. And like our Nordic uh, colleagues and neighbors, Sweden is a strong believer in international cooperation. A strong multilateral uh, order benefits us all. We are better equipped to get uh, through this crisis or any crisis when we work together. I do also want to thank the Secretary General and the United Nations and its agencies uh, for its leadership during this pandemic. And I want to raise three issues uh, which are of vital interest for us all during this pandemic and also in the future. First, we need to ensure a fair distribution of vaccines. The Nordic region will not be safe until everyone is safe. Second, we need to intensify the green transition. It is important in itself, but it is also a vital part of our economic recovery. So we, we must implement the Paris Agreement. And finally, we must reduce inequalities. Crisis often hit those who are the most vulnerable, the hardest. And you can count on us uh, for support in the implementation of the UN 75 Declaration. The Nordic countries will remain your strongest uh, supporters and friends. And the Nordic region uh, is the most integrated region in the world. And let us continue to stand together. We will manage today's situation and whatever the future may hold together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan Löfven. And our next speaker is Country Councillor Veronika Törnros from the Åland Islands. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary General and Your Excellency's colleagues. Uh, my wish is that the pandemic will not be fought either globally nor in the Nordic countries with closed borders, but with collaboration and optimal healthcare systems, good health education, as well as social security mechanisms that facilitate effective implementation of the essential public health interventions. Striking the right balance is not easy. We all have a responsibility to do what we can to fight the pandemic while mitigating the adverse effects of the actions taken to stop the spread of the virus. In this context, it is important that we collaborate across borders, both states and territories, with legislative powers, rather than put up borders, barriers and controls. The virus do not need a passport to pass and spread further, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you, you Veronika Törnros. And our last Prime Minister is Katrin Jakobsdottir from Iceland. And we can't hear you now. Dear Secretary General and dear colleagues, sorry about that. Um, Iceland steadfastly supports the work of the United Nations and we applaud your leadership during these challenging times. The current crisis and the growing international distrust are a stress test for multilateralism, but along with it comes increased awareness of the fact that our fate is very much interlinked as we have seen in the last few months. We need to grasp this opportunity and make sure we recover and rebuild greener and more equal societies for a better future. Iceland fully supports the global response to the pandemic and stresses the importance of even access and fair distribution of a possible vaccine for all. There will be long-term implications of this crisis for our societies and the way we respond today is of utmost importance. We need to promote a green, inclusive transition, protect human rights and equality through the recovery from the pandemic. Gender equality, social justice and good governance are keys to fostering greater social cohesion and trust in our societies. Our future must be based on inclusive, sustainable growth with a focus on protecting our planet from the devastating effects of the climate crisis, which is not going anywhere during this pandemic. So very warm regards from a chilly afternoon in Reykjavik. I would have loved to see you here, but it's good to be with you. Thank you very much, Katrin Jakobsdottir. 
And uh, now it is time for us to uh, re-invite the Secretary General. Uh, are you there? Could you please turn on your microphone again? Uh, we would very much I'm... like to hear your reflections after hearing the Prime Minister's. I think I'm here, yes. You are. Well, I believe that uh, listening to uh, what I heard from countries that are the most developed countries in the world and with the best social protection systems in the world, one reason more for us to feel humble in relation to the weaknesses that this pandemic has shown the world still has, uh, fragilities. Uh, and uh, these, of course, forces us to recognize the need when we recover and we rebuild, not to replicate the past, but to be able to do so, addressing these fragilities and doing so in a sustainable and inclusive way. Fragility in relation to the pandemic, to this one or any future one that comes. Uh, and of course, you have good wealth, health systems in the, in, in the Nordic countries, but there are very weak health systems around the world. We absolutely need effective universal health coverage. We absolutely need that vaccines become a global public good, as it was said. Fragility of climate disruption. Uh, I mean, I think there is a symbol of hope now. Um, we have had the European positions on net zero. Then China came uh, with uh, his commitment on net zero, even if it is uh, before 60, not uh, 2050. But I mean, it's a very important step in the General Assembly. Japan the day before yesterday, announced its commitment to net zero. I think we are creating the conditions with the private sector also more and more involved to have a global coalition for net zero in 2021. And I think the Nordic countries can play a leading role on this. Inequality, another enormous fragility of the world. Again, you have some of the more cohesive societies in the world and you can be an inspiration in a recovery that is based on the sustainable government goals and addressing inequality. And I would add the lawlessness in the cyberspace. We have seen how important digital technologies is when we respond to the COVID-19. But the fact is that digit, the digital world is still very unequal. Uh, half of the world population is not linked to the internet. And at the same time, we have enormous challenges and problems that we are all aware. And we need effective multilateral cooperation with a multi-stakeholder approach to make the digital space a space for good. All this uh, shows that, I mean, we need real global governance, not a, not a global government, I agree, but global governance. Let's recognize our multilateral institutions for the moment are quite weak. And uh, we need multilateral institutions that have more teeth and more appetite to bite, more capacity to, um, uh, to a certain extent, ensure the minimum levels of global governance that are necessary to address the global challenges that we are facing. Thank you very much for these challenging and also inspirational words. And now it's time for us to move forward. And next in line, as you know, are the Nordic Council party groups that have prepared one question each for you. And now I want to remind the speakers, uh, you have maximum one minute for your question. And the Secretary General preferably has one minute for the answer as well. And please remember everyone to turn on your microphone when it's your turn to speak. And the Secretary General may leave his microphone open. Thank you very much. The first speaker, the first group is the Social Democrat group. And it is Annette Lind who has a question. We cannot see Annette Lind now. Okay, but we can't hear Annette Lind. Annette, would you turn on your microphone? Because Yes, I have done that. Okay. Do you hear me? Now we hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the floor. And a special thanks to Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Guterres. It's an honor to have you amongst us here in the Nordic Council. And uh, it's very good for us to have the UN view on the international work in the fight against the COVID-19. As you heard, I represent the, the Social Democratic Group and uh, I come from Denmark. In Denmark, the per case of vaccines has been secured for all citizens in the Commonwealth <coughs> of Denmark, the Faroe Islands and Greenland. Citizens of the Commonwealth will be offered a free vaccine when it is approved. And that's, of course, very positive. But as the 
the Secretary General just said, the vaccines sh shall be available everywhere. And uh, my question tonight is then, you have said a lot, but uh, how can we, in which way are the Nordic countries able to contribute the helping underprivileged countries to get access to corona vaccines? As my Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen just said, we shall take access together. So how can we contribute in the Nordic country? Secretary General? Well, there is an instrument in place. It's called uh, uh, Act Accelerator and a, a facility for vaccines called COVAX, when other 80 countries are involved, as I mentioned. Um, they are committed to both support the development, the production and distribution. Everybody's involved, World Health Organization, Gavi, CEPI, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, a number of countries. Nine producers of vaccines are involved. So now the question is to guarantee that this has the funding that is necessary. Um, there was a first batch of funding of $4 billion that uh, uh, allowed for the beginning. Uh, it is estimated that uh, the next phase requires $14 billion of support. We need to find that support through different sources uh, from member states, uh, the international financial institutions. Uh, the World Bank has already said that it would make available $12 billion, but uh, for the following phase for the developing countries to be able to buy them. Um, uh, but it's a loan. It would be on a loan basis. And uh, I presume that another possibility we have been discussing is the capacity to issue special drawing rights. And uh, um, that is a discussion at the very center of the, um, uh, the Bretton Woods system and for different purposes. But one could be also to guarantee the financing of the vaccine. It's absolutely essential to find those funds because the system is in place and the system would allow for an effective distribution worldwide of a vaccine that would supplement what developed countries are doing, most of them like Denmark, to guarantee that their citizens will have the vaccine available. Thank you very much. And the next group uh, is the center group, and it is Linda Moodig who will pose the question. Thank you, Secretary General. The Nordic governments have set a wonderful common goal in the Nordic, that the Nordic region will be the most integrated and sustainable region in the world by 2030. In normal times, perhaps this vision would slowly become reality. However, the current crisis has shown that the normal can disappear in one night and crisis may become the new normal. We, the Nordics, have a well-developed mutual cooperation, but nevertheless, we were far too unprepared to face the current crisis together. My question is, how do you, Secretary General, from the perspective of the United Nations, would like to see the role of the Nordics in the future development of the international system. What is, according to you, our most important assets and in which ways would you like us to use these assets? Thank you. Secretary, Secretary General. Well, there are many areas. I mean, the Nordics are already living in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030, the forms of solidarity with the developing world. Uh, I uh, also would welcome very much uh, a continued leadership of the Nordic countries in relation to the reform of the UN and the reform of the global governance system. Uh, we still have multilateral organizations that do not represent the present reality. Uh, we have a Security Council with uh, five countries with a veto. We have the Bretton Woods institutions with one country with a veto. Um, uh, the representation no longer corresponds to what the world is today. Um, we need uh, the multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization to have powers that they do not have. They can recommend, but they have no capacity to make sure that their recommendations are implemented. Uh, there is... Uh, I mean, our multilateralism is still very weak. So the Nordic countries, with your fantastic experience of cooperation among yourselves, can give an enormous uh, leadership to this idea of a shared sovereignty to be able to have an effective multilateral system. Thank you very much. And the next group is the Conservative Group and uh, Hans Wallmark. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General. A few days ago, the executive director of the World Food Programme, David Beasley, visited the Swedish parliament. The message from the executive director was that the organization 
feeds 100 million people a day. One consequence of the current pandemic is that hundreds of millions of people are approaching the brink of starvation alarmingly fast. This fundamentally jeopardizes the UN goals in Agenda 2030. In the long run, as the World Food Programme also points out, it's not a feasible solution that people have to live on emergency aid. Therefore, in the light of the pandemic, what more can we do to emphasize that Agenda 2030, the UN goals, and the achievement of the goals also are an agenda for economic growth? Thank you. I think I fully agree that uh, what we need is not uh, to solve problems based on assistance. We need to solve problems based on helping countries to create the capacity to attend to their own needs. Uh, and here there are three or uh, four aspects that are essential. First, countries need to have good governance. Uh, without good governance, they will not be able to do it. I mean, to fight corruption, to guarantee that there is uh, uh, the rule of law, to guarantee that institutions work. And we should help developing countries develop that capacity. At the same time, we need to provide the kind of financial support they require in order to be able to develop their own productive systems, and especially in agriculture, where, of course, there is a lot to be done. Uh, and third, to give them the technical expertise, uh, um, the transfer of technologies is today an absolutely essential aspect in order for them to be able to take profit of the fantastic technological development that we have witnessed all over the world in relation to food production, and uh, um, that could benefit their rural communities. And unfortunately, they, many of them are still using technologies completely outdated. So good, with good governance, adequate financial support, and adequate uh, expertise and technical support, I think we can help the developing world become self-sufficient from that point of view. Thank you very much. The next group is the Nordic Green Left and Heini Heydal. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, for your wishes and leadership. Um, the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis will, of course, affect and have an enormous impact on inequality, human rights, and the economic basis of all peoples and nations. And as you mentioned, this should be the main cause for multilateralism and the core values of the UN and also of the Nordic cooperation. But my question is regarding the concentration of wealth and the ownership of natural resources in the aftermath of the pandemic and in fighting the climate crisis. How do we avoid that accumulated wealth is used to buy and control ownership of natural resources all over the world, especially in, in developing countries, which should be in the ownership of the people according to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and also according to the visions in the UN's International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, if one looks at the present system, uh, the present system is a, stim a system in which uh, uh, the generation of wealth, especially by multilateral corporations, and in multilateral corporations, the extractive industries are particularly important, that generation of wealth is not effectively taxed. So one first thing that we need is much more effective cooperation in taxation. And I would say we need to put an end to tax havens. Uh, tax havens still remain the main factor that allows for um, uh, the concentration of wealth uh, uh, not to be uh, limited in any way uh, by the capacity to put in place uh, effective tax systems that are coordinated uh, among uh, countries. If we look at the, uh, the, the Nordic countries, there's something that they have proven is that it's possible to have relatively high levels of taxation with prosperous societies. If that is true in the Nordic countries, it will be true in the, all over the world. What we have now is a, a number of societies in which the levels of taxation are extremely low and the level of prosperity is also extremely low, except for a few very rich. And then if one looks at the digital world today, we are witnessing a concentration of wealth that is absolutely amazing uh, in relation to a small group of digital companies that basically are not taxed anywhere. No, and uh, this is a central discussion that I believe is absolutely necessary. I'm very much in favor of philanthropy. I'm very much in favor of generosity. But I think that the first thing that we need to do with these groups is to tax them effectively. 
Thank you very much. And the last group is the Nordic Freedom Group, and uh, Aron Emilsson is asking. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Can some political entities become too big and thus make it impossible to implement effective measures? Like the European Union that has failed to expect the Nordic countries in this question. And so basically, with the, as a few exceptions of coordination, even at the European level, that coordination is very limited. What we had is each country going in its own direction and the virus taking profit to go in every direction. On the other hand, we have witnessed a, an increase of uh, what I would call forms of nationalism and populism that undermine international cooperation. And the interesting thing is that when we now look into the performance of countries, those countries with a more populist approach to the response to the COVID, fared, the, the, the consequences, the internal consequences were quite negative and they had the worst possible records in relation to the COVID. So I hope that this will create a, 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 an understanding of the need to strengthen international cooperation. And I must say, I believe that the Nordic countries have been a fantastic example from which the international community could learn a lot. And that was all the party groups. So I say thank you very much for joining us today, Secretary General. We really appreciate your time and also your direct and very clear answers. Thank you, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. All the best. Och nu kommer vi att fortsätta på svenska. Vi byter alltså. I will now continue in Swedish now that we pass on to the more Nordic part of this uh, seminar. During this part of the, the seminar, we will hear the parliamentarians uh, of the Nordic Council to the Prime Ministers. I have the same rules as before. One question maximum for the question and uh, one minute for uh, the answer. Uh, let's uh, also try to hear several of the Prime Ministers. Uh, you can direct your questions to all of them or to one. All the parliamentarians who wants to ask a question, you should now uh, push the button, raise hands, that you can see on your screen. If you have a question, please push this button. And I want just to say that we will probably not have the time to answer all the questions, but we'll do as many as we can. So let's see who gets the possibility to ask the first question. Let's see who first raised their hand on the screen. I can see, I'm looking at my assistants here. They are telling me that it's Odni Hardadotir from Iceland, Vice President of the Nordic Council. She's the first one out to ask a question. Odni, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? The situation now is that COVID-19 pandemic has uh, uncovered difficulties that we have in the Nordic country, like in other countries. The situation is that we have several people that are poorer and the inequality has grown. My question is, therefore, that have the Nordic countries considered to work together on this issue? It's not only a social issue, it's also a health and financial question. And finally, how will these solutions be? So this question is directed to Stefan Löfven. I will ask him to answer this question. I hope that Stefan Löfven is there, that he has heard the question through our interpretation facility. Stefan Löfven, we're talking about the cooperation between our countries. How should we cooperate to solve the problems? Yes, we are collaborating and uh, we have, for instance, had a collaboration on our borders. 
uh, our governments have had exchanges, our authorities have exchanged information. So, uh, of course, we can improve this cooperation. We always can. But I, I don't agree if you say that we have not collaborated during this crisis, because we have. So that's uh, my answer to you. The Shell Arne Ottersen is next one out with his question. Shell Arne, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Lately, I've uh, been talking with a lot of uh, Swedish workers working in Norway because they have been bullied at their place of work because they are called Corona Swedes. We are trying to compete to see who's best when it comes to not ski, but other uh, things. And this uh, is a much deeper issue. Of course, I understand that we don't have an overview of the interaction throughout the, the, what's happening on the borders if you live in Bergen and in uh, Oslo and elsewhere. But on the border between Norway and Sweden, there is a lot of difficulties because of the, these restrictions on the border. I have a few questions about this. To Anna Solberg, will the Norwegian government now uh, try to look at what's going on when you see the bullying of the Swedes that are working in Norway. A question to Stefan Löfven and Anna Solberg. Will you make an effort to uh, alleviate the restrictions on the border between the Sweden and Norway so that people living on this border can work and live normally? Yes, this was a question to Anna Solberg, first of all. Well, let's start by saying that we have a regional way of uh, managing the border zones. So when we have regulations about the closed and open regions, we have based uh, this upon regional numbers and regional infection in the Nordics. Uh, contrary to the rest of Europe, maybe they will follow us. But we've had regions that have been opened, whereas uh, normally the, all of Sweden would have been closed. When you're talking about bullying at the workplace, I've never heard anything about this. Uh, of course, that is totally unacceptable. Uh, we uh, do not want to import infections. We've had a few challenges with that, but we've had quite open borders when it comes to work immigration, because we know that people on both sides of the border depend on a workforce from the other country. And this is a long-standing tradition. Uh, but we have a regional approach when it comes to workers. And uh, a lot of the border zones have been opened, whereas the rest of Sweden has been closed. Stefan Löfven, maybe you also want to talk about the, the border restrictions or, or alleviation of these restrictions. Well, I have to say that what I'm hearing here is completely unacceptable. Between the Nordics, we uh, are, should not do this because uh, the Nordics is so important for us, so we have to do our utmost to keep our good relations during such a pandemic. It is really a very important zone and region for us all. I've never heard about bullying, but uh, there's been a discussion where we uh, see that, you know, neighbors and People living on, on separate sides of the border have, uh, have um, poorer relations now than before, and this is not acceptable, I think. But of course, we also need to uh, live as much as possible without borders. Of course, each uh, country is free to make their own decision when it comes to uh, infection protection, but I think that our uh, ambition is to keep uh, the borders as seamless as possible. We want 
it uh, to work uh, smoothly, both for transportation, for trade, and also for workers. Thank you very much. Next question from Cecilia Tenfjord Toftby. Thank you very much. My question goes to the Danish Prime Minister, Mette Fredriksen. During these last few years, we've seen that the border between Denmark and Sweden has been uh, partially closed 2015 during the refugee crisis and now during the pandemic. This has uh, big consequences for both our countries, especially for the border zones. Uh, we have different way of ways of managing the pandemic. Of course, we need to respect that, but we also, uh, well, what worries me, uh, in addition to the financial consequences, is uh, something that has been mentioned here, the, the way we lose confidence in each other. And I think that is uh, uh, worrying me. I'm worrying for the Nordics, but uh, I would like to ask Mette Fredriksen, how uh, would you uh, see the cooperation without this confidence uh, and the friendship that we have between Denmark and the other Nordic countries? I could, of course, have asked this question to all the other prime ministers. It's important for everyone. But uh, first of all, I would like to hear what Mette Fredriksen has to say about this. Thank you. Mette Fredriksen, yes, thank you very much for your question. I'd like to say that if I put on my Danish glasses, partial uh, closing of the border, it's not a question of uh, confidence between, in this case, uh, Denmark and Sweden. We have a very close and confident relationship uh, uh, during decades, and we that is really the case, but uh, it's I would say that specific uh, situation dictates this, uh, like um, cross-border uh, criminality or two days uh, pandemic, where we need to reduce uh, the traveling uh, because uh, of the infection rate. So I, I think it's important that you see the restrictions on travels between the Nordic countries as a pragmatic uh, system, uh, and this should not undermine our strong neighborhood and our strong uh, Nordic community. That's how we m perceive this, at least. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Christine Juhl. Well, we had an initiative in 2017 to adopt uh, a total ban against uh, nuclear weapons uh, and there were uh, a great many countries who voted in favour, but not many Nordic countries. Uh, there were 50 countries that had ratified the treaty which means that it will enter into force in a few months' time. We have so many nuclear weapons uh, and arms uh, that can kill more people than COVID can. And the nuclear weapons and other arms are so expensive that we could completely eradicate uh, poverty uh, or diseases or all the other tasks that we need uh, to uh, solve. How? Uh, my question is, when will the other Nordic countries ratify the ban on nuclear bans? Instead of being uh, uh, some of the few countries uh, that uh, do not support it, uh, if you want to join the 120 con two countries that do it. All right, this question goes to his own Prime Minister, Mette Fredriksen. We will have to return to the question 
because we don't really know what the problem is, what you refer to. We simply need to uh, look a bit into it before responding. Anna Solberg. Well, we share the goal with uh, a nuclear-free uh, world, but we believe that the treaty is not the right way to deal with it. Uh, the process is not something that uh, the 122 countries have participated in, and NATO has a strategy which uh, also uh, deals with this, and Norway is a member of NATO. So we do not intend to ratify this, and our government does not support it. Stefan Leveen. Yes, first I would like to say that e many of these Arabic states are not... Uh, have not ratified them. So it may harm or undermine non, the non-proliferation treaty. And that's why we have been so cautious about this. So we have not set a date for ratifying it. Uh, we studied the, the issue carefully, whether or not we were going to ratify it, and decided as we did. Sana Marin. Thank you very much for your question. Finland has uh, acceded to the country, and uh, there are many countries who have done so. And we believe that it w is good because this uh, treaty may uh, promote these issues. But now, the Foreign Affairs white paper that will shortly be dealt with in the F Finnish government. Finland uh, has ratified the treaty. And how we're going to participate in this work is something that we need to deliberate further. Thank you. I would like to thank you for your question. Iceland is greatly concerned about uh, demilitarization globally. There are some treaties in this area. That is, treaties uh, or in the field of uh, nuclear arms. But we would rather that the states who own and have a nuclear arms to go to the table and negotiate uh, to see how they can contribute to a world without any nuclear arms. And next speaker. Thank you. We have learned a lot uh, from uh, COVID-19 in recent uh, years, the recent months. Of course, uh, we responded very differently, at least in the beginning when we didn't know anything about uh, COVID-19. But now we know what it's all about. We know that testing is so important. And in Denmark, we are discussing whether or not uh, we should introduce a COVID passport so that you can be tested before you go to uh, another country. Maybe this could be based on an agreement within the Nordic Council because people, for example, would like to go to the summer houses or need to go across borders. Is this something that the prime minister wants to discuss or have discussed? If you could uh, design some kind of a passport to allowing you to travel across borders in the Nordic region after having been tested. Did you direct your question to a particular prime minister or to anyone? Well, if uh, any prime minister basically would like to respond, if it, they think it's a good uh, idea. I start with Katrin Jakobsdottir. Yes, I think it's uh, very important 
for the Nordic countries to uh, collaborate here. And I think uh, that the next step would be that our ministers of health discuss this. I know they've been talking about it. Thank you for your question. This is a very difficult matter. And if uh, it is, for example, uh, would that, for example, in cases where a person has uh, recently been ill, uh, if that would be one situation. And today I read some research and I saw that you don't have uh, Im gained immunity, even though you've been sick with uh, COVID-19 for quite some time. So I think it's an interesting uh, idea. Maybe we could give it a green light. In Finland, we've discussed uh, if you could could be allowed to cross a border if you have passed a negative test. But of course, we want to prevent the virus from migrating from one country to another. Therefore, we promote testing, not only in the Nordic region, but uh, all over Europe. We need uh, quick tests and we also need uh, mass testing. We also need to uh, make sure that uh, the virus uh, is not passed on when many people meet uh, Stefan Levin. I'm quite sure that many countries uh, devote a lot of resources to uh, testing and uh, tracing. We haven't discussed whether or not we should have a passport or, you know, a special passport for people who own houses in different countries. But uh, the ministers for cooperation are continuously discussing if we can do more in order to promote uh, move freedom of movement. And Mette Fredriksen, thank you. Uh, the idea is quite interesting. And how to uh, make sure that uh, travel can be made safely uh, as long as we have COVID-19 around. But we need to continue to do what we can to prevent the virus from spreading across borders. And uh, we see the situation all over Europe. And I don't think it's a good idea here and now, but I think the idea of having some kind of passport to allow you to travel if you've tested negative and based on good uh, information. But uh, we are not at the threshold for such a scheme at the moment with in face of the situation as we're in Europe. The next question goes to Agdell Mjöldes, representing the Nordic Youth Council. Hello. Thank you for letting me attend this meeting. The coronavirus crisis creates major problems for uh, many groups in society, but uh, the biggest problem has been for young people, unemployment, students who cannot continue their studies, particularly if they were studying abroad, not in their own countries. And another situation that uh, we've seen is um, ill mental health. And we must also work uh, to counter this. I would like to ask what the Nordic governments uh, intend to do to help young people, the young generation. What do they intend to do to improve their situation in the face of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and to prevent 
the, the long-term consequences from the pandemic. And I would like to have uh, all prime ministers respond. Thank you. Let's start with Sana Marin. All right, so the question was uh, what the Nordic governments intend to ease the consequences uh, of COVID-19 uh, for young people, if I were to kind of uh, summarize the question. It's clear that young people along with everyone else in our societies uh, have suffered because of this. Young people are very socially active and we ask quite a lot of them if we prohibit them from seeing their friends and uh, if they cannot socialize with others or participate in student parties. That's the normal life for young people. It's affected many young people. And there are also negative uh, consequences because of this. In Finland, we have, for example, had uh, uh, distance uh, teaching, uh, remote uh, education, and uh, we need more and better support for all these pupils and students. We also need to um, ensure that uh, they can uh, also uh, catch up with what they have lost. But we see that various regions in Finland have opportunities to and possibilities for determining how they want this themselves. But I think that uh, the pandemic has uh, actually affected young people more. They would have liked to party with their friends and socialize with them, but the pandemic is here. We need to simply uh, live it. Anna Solberg. Thank you. We try to help young people at different levels. We have an initiative, uh, the uh, 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 promotion effort, uh, where we try to uh, bring young people, students who have uh, dropped out of school, to bring them back in. Uh, Big, so that they can complete their education since they can't get the jobs. We have increased the, the number of student places at university by 4,000 to allow them to uh, opt for further education in this situation. So this uh, is not for young people, but it's also for young people. It also applies to young people who have, uh, who older people who have been laid off and who want to uh, uh, to upgrade their education. But it's also very clear when it comes to young people that uh, school nurses uh, should uh, also make uh, funds available in municipalities uh, to uh, make people stay in school. We also ask uh, universities uh, to facilitate so that new students who have just started their educational programs uh, can meet in person other students. Uh, because if it's all distance uh, teaching, then they hardly see any other. I have children who are students myself, so I know that uh, the socializing and social setting is very different from what they've been looking forward to because they come to a new place and they need to get to know people. Next, Stefan Leven. All right, uh, 
yes, I can appreciate that uh, the restrictions are difficult for young people, especially if they also live in other countries. But fewer people can go abroad, and in such cases, uh, there will be a break. But it's uh, also more important to let them be able to study in their own country. We also see that uh, young people have a, a right to education. It's important uh, that they can uh, finish their education. We don't shut schools down. But we have promoted distance uh, teaching at universities and upper secondary schools. We have increased the number of uh, places uh, in education program extensively and also uh, promote contact with the uh, social partners and uh, with uh, the business community to try to open up for young people. And employment, combating uh, unemployment is something that we give priority to uh, when it comes to economic efforts. Uh, young people but is very important, but also uh, further education. Katrin Jakobsdottir. The next speaker is Katrin Jakobsdottir. Um, uh, thank you for this question. What we see in connection with this pandemic is that uh, the, uh, the health of young people has uh, been affected. We see that young people are being the most affected here and we've tried to keep all the schools open. We have a remote education in the upper secondary and university sector but uh, of course when you're a university student uh, a big part of this is the social part and that's why we've tried to offer psychology help because we see that especially the younger students find it very, very difficult to not being able to see other people. That is extremely important. It's extremely important that we use uh, the public sector in order to create new jobs. We've tried to do this in connection with innovation and research in order to offer new jobs for young people after the pandemic. Mette Fredriksen. Yes, thank you very much. I'll be brief. I think my colleagues have said clearly enough that we need to prioritize the young people in the midst of this crisis. I think all the Nordic countries have experienced the same thing as uh, Denmark. If we have, if the unemployment is too big, I think we uh, stand at risk to lose a whole generation of young people. So uh, it's really important to weather this uh, crisis without uh, too big uh, financial consequences so that young people can find jobs afterwards and uh, uh, the uh, uh, education possibilities uh, must be increased during this period where there are lesser jobs for young people. So, of course, uh, education is essential, of course, uh, to get through this crisis, but that has been said to uh, by my colleagues as well, of course. Let me now give the floor to Veronika Törnros. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm very sorry, but thank you very much for this question. We 
have uh, the great privilege here in Ireland that 67% of our students at university level, they are in Sweden. We're very grateful for that. We have a few in Finland, but most of them are in Sweden. So our students are in the Swedish system. Uh, so thank you uh, for this question, but that is how we've solved this challenge here. Kim Kielsen. We also have uh, recognized and approved the Nordic uh, Corona tests up here. Uh, two to five days, uh, the tests, and when they arrive in Greenland, they need to be quarantined for five days, followed by another test. And when that has been done, we want them to uh, be quarantined during nine days. And this means that we've only had 17 cases, uh, infection cases here. 16 of them are well again. We have one uh, patient right now with coronavirus. So uh, the young people here have not suffer too much. They have a more or less normal life. Of course, they want to travel like any other young pe uh, person, like uh, people arriving from Denmark and elsewhere, and uh, they have accepted all the measures that have been introduced, and they have respected all the recommendations uh, with social distancing and so on. So I think we've succeeded well with all these measures. Uh, but of course, after 10 months, uh, people are relaxing a little bit right now. Uh, but of course now the, they might want to travel abroad, but we have Huge pos we have good possibility of closing the borders to our country if this happens with uh, all the ships that arrive and so on. So I think we've uh, managed quite well during this crisis. I now give the floor to Badr Nielsen. Yes, the sit COVID situation in the Faroe Islands has been under control uh, more or less the whole time. Even if we've had open borders and uh, quite uh, large tourism here in June, July and August, uh, this uh, has stopped now because nobody travels anymore. But we've had a lot of testing uh, at arrival in the Faroe Islands, and uh, we have restarted the schools, sports activities, and so on. So even if we have a few cases of infection in the Faroe Islands, we uh, have to be uh, uh, still have to be quite careful. So we have an almost a normal life in the Faroe Island. But uh, the only thing is the social distancing. That is not normal for us. We like to gather and to be together. But that is not something we see in the Faroe Islands now. But the young people and uh, the rest of the population live uh, more or less like there was no corona virus. But we have to, of course, remind them to keep uh, their distance. And we have not needed to use the legislation uh, to regulate this. We see that people have um, taken the responsibility to follow the rules that have been uh, uh, introduce. Thank you, Bardo Listen. Thanks to all the prime ministers, all the parliamentarians, and 
thank you very much to all those who wanted to ask questions, but uh, for whom we didn't have time. Thank uh, you very much uh, to all of the people who have been watching this. This uh, webinar is over. Have a nice evening and please follow the prize ceremony uh, of the Nordic uh, Nordic Council 2110 uh, Icelandic tea time and 2210 uh, uh, Finnish time. Thank you and have a very nice evening.